So, I'm Clemence Coffier, I'm working for Red Hat, I'm a Vertex Core developer, so I'm a full-time developer on Vertex Core and on the Vertex ecosystem. And uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, Vertex, of course, but how to build uh, distributed applications. So, and as you know, distributed applications are going to fail. So it will fail today, and we will see at what point of time in my demo it's going to fail. It's going to fail, I'm sure. Since yesterday, it always failed. Um, um, so I did a couple of, uh, of work before joining Red Hat. Uh, at the beginning, I was an academic, I was a professor at university, so sometimes I would refer to uh, very old papers. Um, I did management, I did development, and so on. But What's interesting today is that a lot of talks yesterday are speaking or mentioning microservices. Microservices are kind of refurbished or rebranded distributed applications because they are distributed. But remember, do you know how to build a distributed application today? Since the 60s, we failed. So, because it's 2016, we are going to succeed at Dr. Lodan. And we are going to see how we can try to build something about how we have to be prepared to fail at the top. So, uh, first thing is what is Vertex? So, Vertex can be defined as a toolkit to build uh, distributed and reactive applications on top of the Java virtual machine using an asynchronous uh, non blocking development model. That's a lot of buzzwords, uh, that's a lot of weird words uh, all together, so let's try to define what that means. So, the first thing is Vertex is not an app server. Vertex is not a container. Vertex is not a framework. Vertex is a toolkit. Maybe Vertex is just a plain, boring job. You know, Java, launching a Vertex app is doing a main. You know, public, static, uh, main, string array, the things that you were doing at university, and since that, you, you lost a li little bit this. So, it's very simple. It's really a library that you will put in your class path and it will provide the API but also an execution model. And this execution model makes it really powerful to build modern applications. So all Vertex components are also playing on class. So if you want to use them in different contexts, like in WAR, like in Spring Boot, like uh, in Java E applications, like in OSGI or whatever you're doing, you can't because what's that? Just jazz. Um, and your application will just depend on those jobs. So you will just compute your class paths, your file jars, your OSGI uh, framework, as you want. As soon as you have your applications, Vertex components, and all the other components. That's very simple. Actually, these slides are a Vertex application. This slides are a Vertex application, and I will prove it. How do we prove that it's a Vertex application? I will start it. If I start the application, Fresh doesn't work. Right. So let's restart it and now pray. So it's actually not any kind of application to this recent. And what you see here is a cluster. So right now there is only one node in my cluster, so it's a distributed application of one node. It's still distributed. And it restarted. Woohoo! So this application is packaged with a file jar, so I just launch it with a Java uh, dash jar. It has a main that just starts a vertex and deploy uh, uh, some components, some code, and so on. We have three main dependencies. We have vertex core. Well, if you want to use vertex, you will have to use that. Um, we have vertex web, which is a component to build uh, modern web applications. What is a modern web application? Well, modern web applications and applications where you have more JavaScript code running in your browser than server code. You know what I mean? Such kind of application. So it obviously REST, but also all the real-time communication we have with your browser, um, everything around calls, um, authentication, and so on. So Vertex Web will provide uh, everything around uh, this to build such kind of application. Then I use Vertex as a cast, which is one way to build a Vertex cluster. It's not the only way. We have other way. We have big groups. We have Goalkeeper. We have uh, Apache Ignite. But for this demo, I will use Hazelcast. If you don't know what Hazelcast is, it's a in-memory data grid. So I just, in this context, just do the membership between my my uh, uh, my different uh, 
from NAS. So it's a distributed application, and we call a lot of distributed applications. Who developed, who was developer in the early uh, 2000s? So all those developers, you can ask them, they all love Koba. Right? Koba was cool, no? RMI, Gini, all those uh, technologies that were developed in the uh, end of the 90s and beginning of 2000s um, was there to build distributed systems. But actually, well, we hate them. Hold on. Who loves web service today? Who loves SOAP? Who wants to debug a WSDL file? <laughs> ah, there is one there. OK, I have a job for you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Who loves DNS? DNS is very famous today for microservices. But debugging a DNS issue, we did that last week uh, for Rapids. So crazy, the spec is really old and so on. So there's many, many issues to, to handle, like scalability, like reliability, like well, HTTP one, but now we have HTTP two. What does that change? It's almost change everything. All the communication and so on. It's very cool, but it changes a lot of things. Um, we have this IoT. IoT is completely changing how we are building out applications. Before that, I, I, I was uh, visiting a. a customer of Red Hat, but also a friend, and he told me about the evolution of the IT. It's a big, big insurance. And they said, well, at the beginning, um, we were using just plain our app server. And we don't care because we have 10 users at the same time. We hope can manage 10 users at the same time. But then we have mobile. And come on, users start using their mobile to discuss with our system. Ha! And it starts to not be 10, but 50 to 100. And it starts to be a bit of an issue, so they change the app It's what big company does when they have a performance issue, they change the technology. Um, and now they have, for an insurance that's weird, they have a couple of, well, a dozen of IoT projects. And fortunately for them, they realize that this small sensor never sleeps. They will always send data to their server and get data back. So they have no idea how they will scale to that level. Well, I try to sell money, but let's see. Um, so there is many things around distributed, <coughs> but distributed, distributed application has never been better uh, summarized than by Leslie Lambert. A distributed system is a system that doesn't work. That's pretty cool. Uh, that was uh, coined in the 80s and still valid in 2016. Um, well, there's a couple of things. When we build a distributed system, so first, why are we building distributed systems? We build distributed systems because at the beginning, um, we have limited resources, limited CPU, limited memory, limited uh, um, storage, and so on. So as we wanted to expand this, we didn't say, OK, no problem. We will have several machines and stuff. However, when you have just two machines, you have things that are not meaningless, like the network is not reliable. Sorry. Um, here it's a Wi-Fi connection. I'm pretty sure I will lose the Wi-Fi connection before the end of my talk. Um, networks just break at any time. Uh, the latency. Latency what it is. It's the time that will be spent by your packets or message between the two, uh, the two hosts, the, the two entities. It's not zero. You don't have networks that are fast enough. There is some point of time where you don't even know where your message is. It's somewhere in between. You have no idea where it is. Don't forget this. Uh, topology does not change. We all want to do cloud applications. We love clouds. Well, except that, do you know where the machines that are running your application? Because there is machines running your application. Sorry, and the, the cloud is not just about virtualizing. There is somewhere a machine that runs your app. Do you know where it is? I don't know. Do you know? Are you sure that it's always the same? Probably not. And when you are building distributed applications, so where you have several nodes, well, they may change. It may move. And actually, if you look at how Amazon is working, it's always moving. That's amazing. It's always moving because they replace hardware to 
it's incredible how they manage it. I, I don't even know how it's working, so it's so complicated. Um, I said that Vertex is, uh, is made with reactive um, systems, and I will use the term systems and not reactive programs. Um, why? It's because today we reach a point where reactiveness makes much more sense than before. So, don't mistake, reactive systems exist in the 60s. Actor systems, Erlang, spreadsheets are, well, actor systems and Erlang are built to, uh, are made to build reactive systems. Spreadsheet is a right, uh, reactive product. Um, reactive system is what? A reactive system is a system that needs to be responsive. Responsive means that it will answer in an acceptable time. I'll let you define what acceptable means in your context. It can be a couple of milliseconds, it can be nothing, or it can be one minute. It really depends on your context. It needs to be elastic. That means that your system may have one user at a time or 10,000 users at a time. And it can change. In a couple of seconds, it can change. Look at Ticketmaster. For the next YouTube uh, big show or whatever kind of uh, big band or popular band you have, uh, or you want, imagine between the opening and when it's sold out, it's a couple of seconds. Minutes. If it's a couple of days, then your band is not that popular. But, um, <coughs> see, and they have to handle this whole. So they need to have some way to man manage it. It needs to be resilient. As Leslie Lampard say, it's going to fail. I will have, it's going to fail, and generally it's in production. We all know that. So you need to be, to design the software in a way that it will handle failures. Failures are part of the game, are part of your code. We are humans, we are making failures, we are making bugs. But in distributed applications, the theory and the physical law make failures, well, always. There is always failures. Um, if we stop here, um, what people are defined in what system is just a system that works. Just something that responds, that handle load, and that manage failures gracefully. So, system that works. What they did in the Reactive Manifesto that was written a couple of years ago by uh, people from uh, originally from ACA uh, and TypeSafe, and now it's renaming uh, Lightband, um, and rebranded as Lightband, uh, they also have, it needs to be built on asynchronous message pacing. And because of the asynchronous message pacing, it will be much easier to get those uh, uh, products. And we will see that in this talk. We will see how a synchronous message basically will have to build some kind of things. Uh, asynchronous is hard. Asynchronous is not the way you develop today. Asynchronous is about callbacks, it's about threads, it's about certain kind of things. So it's hard. But why is it important today? It's because there is no free lunch. The Moore's law doesn't work anymore. Before, you don't care, you can do really, really slow code. I even see production code where we thread not sleep. Just because they say, well, we know that we not be done, so we sleep for a couple of seconds, and we know that after a couple of seconds, the result will be there. Yeah, so relying on thread not sleep, that is a really good idea. But they say, we don't care, because in production, it will be really fast, because the system is faster and faster and faster. That was before. This doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't apply because CPU manufacturers say, well, we are not able to go any faster in a single core. But they're smart. They say, okay, we can go faster in a single core, but we can have several cores. They know how to make money, right? The, that's a genius idea. However, as soon as you have several cores, well, you have several things happening at the same time. Before, one core, one thing at a time. One instruction at a time. Several core, several things at a time. And this is tricky because that means that the software to use the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure will have to be designed to support parallel slash concurrent execution. And this is not that simple. Looking at your boom. Too much thread, boom. That things that doesn't work, doesn't scale on so many, uh, on many uh, CPUs. 
You are the cloud, you get one of the new uh, Amazon machines. You can't believe the number of cores they provide you. I think uh, so, something like 30 cores, something like that. Imagine 30 cores, 30 things happening at the same time. The concurrency is that. And the synchronize you will have to have if you don't do that uh, correctly. So, reactive systems were made to uh, turn on this and to make developing applications that will scale where on one processor but also on several machines correctly. Uh, last point about Vertex, Vertex is polyglot. We, we won't see that in this talk, there is other talk to, uh, where I, I, I focus on this. Um, it runs on the GVM, but that doesn't mean that it has to be developed in Java. It can be developed in Ruby, Ruby, JavaScript, Ceylon, or almost any uh, Java language that executes on the GVM. Uh, that's the official one. We have also Scala, uh, Jiton, so Python, um, uh, TypeScript, uh, Kotlin, um, I'm forgetting a lot of them. So we have some other language too. Um, that said, it runs on the GVM. So if you're looking at JavaScript, it won't be now. It will be uh, national. So be aware of this. This is a big difference. There is nothing this is really, really different. So a toolkit to build distributed systems, that's why uh, I will talk right now. Um, Vertex will let you build distributed systems. But, sorry, there is no magic. If you want to build a distributed system that works, you will have to do the work yourself. We don't provide the magic annotations that say, hey, don't worry, I manage everything. It won't do that. It won't do that because we know that it's not going to work correctly. You will have to debug it. You will have to look at, uh, when you use this kind of framework, you will have to look at uh, stack trace, which are 200 lines long, and you scroll, 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 down, down, down. Oh, that's my JavaScript. Lever minus 200. You know this, no? And you are really happy when you start seeing your class. You say, oh, that's mine. Yeah, the tricky thing is you have 200 cores in the So that's it's a bit hard to to handle. Um, we will consider failures as a first class citizen. That means that failures are not exceptional. Failures are part of the life of your software. This is really something important. Um, it's not an all in one solution. It will provide a set of basic building blocks, and it's up to you to build your own framework or whatever. Why? Because every software looks the same, they are inherently unique. All the software is unique. You do one app, you want to do a kind of the same app in another company, it will be different. And as it will be different, you can't come up with a magic framework that will work all of them. So, if you want to do it correctly, provide a building block, we let you do your uniqueness. Um, as I said, the application won't be just plain distributed applications. They are going to be reactive too. That means that the application you are going to develop with Vertex will be responsive. You will be able to handle a lot of connections per second. A lot. On a Raspberry Pi first generation, one core, we can handle easily 10,000 requests per second. And the Raspberry Pi just say, well, come on, give me more. So, um, it's elastic. You want more, just add a node in the cluster. Another story. You want less? Remove the knot. Built in one robin. Nothing to do for you. Um, failure of first class citizen, I said that. Also, failover. Crash are part of the life of your application. We all know that we are not really good to clean the memory and stuff like that. So sometimes we may fail in out of memory. Um, well, that will crash the GVM. Don't worry. If you configure that text with the HMO, it will restart for you. Um, and it's asynchronous message space. This will be implemented using an asynchronous and non-blocking uh, development model that we can uh, explain like that. This is a traditional execution model, one thread per connection. So imagine that you have three tasks to do, A, B, C, and A, fortunately, is going to do some stuff with a database. And connect to the database, Yeah, the connection is going to be established in a couple of seconds. Okay, back. Uh, then you do the select, do stuff, and then back. But during this couple of seconds, wow, your thread here is stuck. It's blocked. 
Oh, come on, the thread is expensive. <coughs> and if you have many, many threads, then you are spending more time in switching between threads than already doing active work, yeah, actual work. In a non-blocking distributed, uh, non-blocking asynchronous uh, development model, it won't work like that. A start, it says, okay, I want to establish a connection with the database and do something. So it includes that somewhere, release the thread, then we can do B, then we can do C, and then we have some free time. So the thread has some free time, that means handling something else, or uh, doing what, well, something different, or just wait for the next task to be included and do that. And once this will be done, we will get a notification and A can complete its execution. May or may not happen. Distributed system fail, and even if we have very really good GDBC driver today, there is some from a big, big, big company, and that is also doing uh, Java, if you know what I mean, um, that sometimes, well, we don't get an, a stack trace. We don't get an exception. It just lost somewhere. And we don't know. So you thread, you thread is blocked. Well, in this model, it will be blocked forever. So don't worry, there is a, a lot of uh, um, Oracle um, uh, database specialists that will come at your place, be very expensive to debug that. Don't worry, they are really expensive, but they debug this. Um, what Vertex will provide on top of this development model is a set of building blocks. First, we will have the basics TCP, UDP, HTTP 1 and 2 servers and clients. This is provided. Um, DNS client, non blocking. Oh, DNS is the most blocking thing in the GVM. As soon as you resolve a, a host name, this is blocking. You need to know that because if your DNS server is kind of slow, well, you will be stuck. You know, you just open a new URL, but this URL is google.com. Well, that one should be fast. Uh, but something that is less likely to be into cache, uh, well, this is going to be slow. Uh, built in clustering, event based from this engine, distributed data structure, we will see why, uh, consensus and so on. Um, built in load balancing, failover, pluggable uh, service discovery. Um, I won't really mention that, it's very important in. Uh, in um, microservices uh, to discover all the microservices. Why is pluggable? Because you are unique. Your infrastructure, your production infrastructure is unique. Maybe you are going to use consume, maybe you are going to use Kubernetes, maybe you are using to use DNS, maybe you are going to use a text, a text file where you have all the endpoints inside. It does exist. Um, sorry, it's pluggable. We <coughs> have a uh, circuit breaker here where we will explain why and how we well, where is it useful or not? Matrix, fair, and so on. So, enough talking, enough, <coughs> enough talking, sorry. Um, I'm a bit sick since a couple of days. Uh, so sometimes my voice looks like the alpha door, so don't worry. Um, we will do the first thing we do with Vertex. Request reply. That's the other world. The first thing you do with Vertex is creating an HTTP server and get some log back, get some request and answer. So to get a vertex instance, you do vertex.vertex, okay? Then you do vertex.createHttp server, and then you have two things. Two things that we call handlers. They are pretty important. A handler is something that gets an event from the reactive scene and handles it. The first handler we have gets an event of type HTTP request. Each HTTP request will be an event. And your program, which is very quick here, will react to that, get this event, consume it, and send the response. The second thing here is much more interesting. Because, well, here we see it. We get an event, we reply. The listen here will start the HTTP server. This is really an asynchronous approach because starting an HTTP server takes a lot of time. There is many things that happen, happen between your program to GVM and the operating system to check if the process is ready, to negotiate the sockets and stuff like that. This is going to take a lot of time, we don't want to block, so we just say, well, when you're done, call me. And this will be, this is what is done by the handler, this will be called when the HTTP server has started. Well, has started or has failed, because starting an HTTP server can fail, when the whole product is not free or you have no permission and so on. 
So here what you get here, the so type of the event, where here it was an HTTP request, here it's an async result. It's a result of an asynchronous operation. And the first thing you will do is check if that succeeded or not. You will see this pattern a lot in Vertex. Because why wow, is that lot of code? Really look at how Node is working. Node callbacks get the error as first parameter and you need to check if it's an error before trying to get a second parameter, which is the result. If you look at Go, Go, after every call, you need to check if the result of the previous call was not nil. They use nil and not null. Modern system considers that this is normal. And actually, it makes sense because failures need to be handled by you, not exceptional, really, by you. Um, what I will do now is that I will start this uh, in the background and we'll see what we get the answer here. So this is my code here. Um, so see, it's a main. <laughs> this is an IntelliJ you can use and text editor, whatever. We don't care because we don't need a plugin. It's just a library. As soon as you can compile Java, you are. Well, you, you should use an IDE you know, because if you do everything with a notepad or it's kind of boring. But you can. So here I have my two handlers, the first one. Uh, just uh, get, the, uh, get the request, write the response, uh, because the browser um, is executed uh, in another namespace, so I use the course. Uh, don't use star in production, please. Um, what? Uh, and then I just write G, uh, G, BCN. I just write the, the time. I will come back to that. And the name of the thread. So, if I start this, And now I can work. Yahoo! <coughs> Works. Two important things here is that here it's written Yahoo. And here it's written Chu. The circular thing is uh, run right away because it's always a single one. It doesn't make sense, but it's wrong. Um, but every time it's the same thread. I click. You see the time it works. As it's the same thread, you know, daytime formatter should not be shown because they are not uh, thread safe. But here we don't care, it's the same thread. Always the same thread executing your, your code. Look. Always the same. So, uh, there is only one thread. No synchronized, no volatile. We don't care about thread safety, it's always the same thread. There is less, really, it can't be a deadlock. There is one thread. So. But this thread is named event loop. That's weird. But what are event loops says? What are they? Uh, so event loops are poor too. They uh, come from the 60s, 70s, maybe 70s. Um, an event loop is something that takes events as input. So he has a buffer of event, a queue of event here, and has a set of handlers. Good. We already saw what handlers are. And it's actually three lines of code. Something that I was uh, teaching at the first year of university is why true just write that. Get next event, find the handler, dispatch. Next event, take the event, find the handler, dispatch. Is that complicated? That's simple, no? But you come with a cost. Is if one of the handler here is blocking, nothing else will be executed. Because what? Well, the idea behind that is that it must never block, because if you block, you block the thread. Remember, it's always the same thread, so if you block the thread, hey, nothing will happen. You know. It will just queue events until it explodes. In general, it's bloody, so don't do that. Never, ever block the event loop. That's a golden rule. For all event loop systems, not only vertex, for all event loop systems, you should never, ever block the event loop. Android, not whatever. Yes, Android is an event for all the activities here. Uh, actually, Vertex is a bit smarter than having a single event loop. It has one event loop per CPU core, and it will dispatch a lot among all the CPU cores. You don't have to manage that yourself. It will, it's given. We do that for you. So if you have eight uh, cores in your, in your CPU, you will have actually eight event loops. But once a handler is called by one event loop, it will always be called by the same event. 
we guarantee that. That means that your handler will never be executed concurrently. That means that you don't care about synchronization. <coughs> that means that you won't spend your night debugging a deadlock in production. I'm so sorry about this news. <coughs> you will be able to sleep. And as I said, once now we, we know how handlers and, and working, what does Vertex Web provide? Really, when you have this in mind, everything made simple. What Vertex Web is doing, it lets you do modern web application and one of the things is REST API. <coughs> it's pretty close to Happy or ExpressJS or all this stuff. So, what should we do? You just get some requests. Here you have a component that is named router with a set of routes, finding the right route, call the route, and all based on the event loop. Very simple. And with this, you can imagine almost any system. Uh, however, we want to have a distributed system. And distributed system are a bit more than just calling HTTP stuff. It's, oops, that was, oh. I know, I should not plug this one to the screen. When the demo failed, I will plug this one. Um, um, but right now it's working. Um, so, one thing we will do in distributed application, especially in microservices, is having one service calling another service. And let's stay right now in the HTTP world. So you will have components that will call another HTTP set. Things start to be interesting here because since the 80s, we have guessed or yeah, guess our way of thinking of all this work. Today you have libraries that will make uh, HTTP call in one line in your code. So we do computation, 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 one line of code that do a get uh, slash uh, uh, blah blah slash uh, get my resource as JSON, just one line of code. Except that this one line of code is very very slow in comparison of the other lines. So in Vertex we won't do that. In Vertex everything that is slow means it has to be asynchronous. And our HTTP client is asynchronous. You can't use it to build a synchronous system. It will be always asynchronous because it has to be asynchronous. So, we provide this HTTP client, configure like that, and then you do uh, get, get now, you get the response. And actually, here you have two nested number. We will develop that. So, this, um, here I have my router. Uh, oops. That's right. Um, so here I have my router, I create a router, a vertex router, and then just set a colander, and on slash, I will call this handler. And this handler will call my client, HTTP client, do a get no, get no, um, on a slash, and on, um, yeah, on slash. It will get a response. So now I have the response. So I can, for example, do the system out. Uh, status, uh, status message, but that's not that you have the response, that you have actually the body. This is two separate things in HTTP. You can get the response, but because of chunk string and stuff like that, the content may arrive a bit later. So you write a second thing, um, response dot body handler. Here you get something that is buffer, which is a, a byte array, more or less, a wrapped uh, byte array. And this handler will be called when the content has been read. It will be two separated events. Yes, they will be very close, but actually it's not that simple in production. You will see they are not that close. And uh, now I will say uh, rc dot response response don't figure right now and uh, voila and prefer dot to string. If I start this. So remember, I have my slides as one application, I have this other HTTP server somewhere, and I have this one, so I already have three nodes. Now I go there, that, there we go. So we have our browser that do an Ajax uh, request to uh, my uh, Vertex Web Router um, that use an HTTP client to call my first uh, uh, server that I have started before, and aggregate the answer and get that back. 
and this in a couple of lines, and this in a fully asynchronous way. So you can you can try to collect a lot of time. You can use getting to get uh, 100 or 10,000 connections per second. Doesn't care. It will work. Right now, this is almost well on one core of, of this developer here. You can under easily uh, Swiss uh, 30,000 uh, connections. That's it. So that's because the event, we never plot the event. So we just do what it has to do. However, this works when you are dealing with a synchronous system, but we are surrounded by blocking system. Yes, database, file system. File system is blocking. And it makes sense because, well, um, when you write on your hard disk, it's better if it's not a synchronous. Think about it. Um, so you have, at some point, deal with a blocking system. And Vertex provided a very fantastic way of doing that. It's called execute blocking. So execute blocking is called in the event loop that you are not allowed to block. Remember it. So you will get here a first uh, a function. And this function will be executed in another thread, which is named the worker thread. This thread here. Do is blocking work, dealing with GDBC or whatever. When it has completed, it will report the completion or failure on this future object here, and then it will call this function here in the event loop. So you don't block. You just delegate the blocking work to some, some, um, someone else. So as, uh, with this, you can uh, integrate with, obviously, GDBC, but any uh, blocking system. Oh, it works actually. It generally will provide an abstraction here, a client. Remember, in computer, uh, computer science will always well, we like putting things uh, in between to abstract it. So that your call, you are in the event loop, you will queue some work uh, to the client that will deal with this on, uh, you know, with this blocking things in an internal uh, thread or worker thread, do stuff, and then call you back. Something that is very, very, very important. This method here should be called in the same thread as this one. If not, then you, uh, you break the assumption that your code will be only executed by one thread. If you break this, that means that you will have one of synchronized, large, volatile, deadlock, lightlock, fairness, and so on. And you don't want that. Seriously, you don't want that. So that was for HTTP. Everything I said for HTTP is, is valid for uh, UDP and TCP. But HTTP is much more visible. Uh, let's do uh, focus now on a certain interaction uh, scheme, which is Emax. HTTP is a request, you get a reply. Messaging is oh, much more interesting. Um, Vertex comes with a built in uh, event bus that is uh, natively distributed. Um, um, and it has basically two ideas, address and handlers. Uh, address is just an opaque string, and handlers where you get uh, some, uh, some events. Uh, three type of delivery. The first one is point to point. You uh, send a message to one guy, and he will get this. Publish, subscribe, of course. And uh, request response. You send to one guy, and he, our, uh, he can reply to you. It would be like that. Send to an address the message, expect a reply, that's a handler, and then you consume this address and you can reply. Uh, we'll skip this. Uh, the demo I will do now, uh, I need to be a bit faster, but, uh, is having really a cluster and a distributed event bus. I have this application here that is a the same as before, except that I run Vertex in cluster mode, so I just say Vertex or cluster Vertex. And uh, every two seconds, I just send some JSON object on the event bus. This JSON object is received by the browser automatically. So we already have a distributed application exchanging message. How the communication works here? Well, we will see that in a second. It's uh, it's <coughs> here to work, I guess. Um, what we can do now is get someone else in the game. Now, 
The event bus is so simple in terms of API just based on TCP that anything can interact on the event bus, even not. And here, we have a node program that just send event on the event bus, and we've got all the events there. So we have an application where we have Vertex, Browser, Vertex, uh, so the slides, and another application. And it all send events. It can do reply, it can do everything. How it works is we have the, the event bus is so simple uh, that we can have bridge. Here, the bridge we are using for both the browser and node is a SuchJS. So SuchJS is a JavaScript library. Uh, it's, it's not a popular one, meaning that it's more than two months old. Um, it's, um, it's actually negotiate the communication uh, with the browser, so it will uh, restfully integrate uh, uh, to. Uh, you will start by WebSocket and server side event and then uh, long polling Ajax, uh, then long polling. Uh, and if you are using Internet Explorer 6, it will use an iframe. Yeah, it works with Internet Explorer 6, we have users using that, it's crazy. Um, now that we use the WebSocket here because now the WebSocket support is great. Uh, there's nothing we can do better than this. So now that we send events, this guy over there is sending events, and we just push events to the browser. And in what we have there. Um, don't be fooled. We are not uh, building boundary systems, so you have to uh, uh, be prepared to fail and to handle those failures. Oops. Couple of things to handle the failures. The first one uh, is to set a delivery option here, set timeout. So I send an event and I say that in one second I want to get a reply. If I don't get a reply, the sending is considered as a fail. So circle so uh, signal now. Timeout doesn't mean it's a fail. So we know that since 1985, that's been proven, medically speaking, proven. So, timeout means that something bad happens. Either the first message didn't, didn't reach the destination, or the operation failed, or the result didn't reach the, the, the first node. Doesn't mean that the operation has failed. And fortunately, today, timeout is the way we all use. But that doesn't mean it has, it's really fair. You need to think about that. You need to design your system to be important and stuff like that, because this uh, <coughs> is, well, it has been proven in my I will skip this one. When you do HTTP, um, you can have exception number, which is another way to handle uh, failures. Exception numbers is, well, when you get a response, you do an exception handler, which is an handler, and the event is a scrolling. So it's an exception. It's not an exception that has been scrolled, it's true, but really a, a, a result that is a failure. Um, we have two exception handler when we're doing HTTP. The first one, um, we will start by that one. This one means that the connection with the server cannot be established. Why? Well, because Maybe the DNS resolution has failed or whatever. We can also add a timeout. That means we did the request, but we didn't have a reply before 3, uh, three seconds. And then the exception order will be called automatically with a, uh, with a failure, timeout failure. <laughs> Second uh, exception order here is you read the content, but the content is corrupted. Cut in the middle of the In the middle. Uh, that Often happen when, if you do mobile applications because of roaming and, and stuff like that. This exception number is different because this is really specific to the communication has been established, but the content cannot be read. Um, the last things we can do is use a circuit breaker. So with exception number and the timeout, it gives you the possibility to react. You get the failure and you can uh, <coughs> implement a fallback or something like that. But at every request, you will emit a request to the other side, to the other endpoint. So you will, if it doesn't work, you will increase the uh, pressure on this second endpoint. That's not cool. You need to give it some time uh, to restart, or to breathe, or to come back to a 
state where it's handle request correct. That's what the group worker uh, is doing. It's actually very simple. It's an automata with three states. Um, first, you are closed, meaning everything's fine. And this, in this state, you keep the number of uh, you keep track on the number of failure. Then, so you do a connection, HTTP or whatever. Um, and if it fails, we increase the number of failures. And when we reach a threshold, we go to the open state, meaning boom, we open the circuit. All new connections or requests will directly go to a fallback and not uh, and not reach the, the endpoint that is not working right now. That means uh, to give him time to to relax, to restart, to uh, well, to reboot, because we always do that when we have failures like that. We just reboot the system, so we don't emit requests. We just have a graceful uh, fallback. Periodically, he will try to let one request pass to see if this system is back online. And when it's back online, we are back to the closed state, and if not, then we will wait again for a couple of seconds. Well, everything is configurable, but that's how it works. So, circuit breaker, just a way to be cool with the server you are calling. To say, okay, we know that you are, you are going to fail, I don't want to have pressure on you, so if you are failing, don't worry, we will hold on. We will do something else. Oops. Um, how does that work? Um, oh yeah. Uh, we have a circuit breaker here that is called CP, and we just do execute with fallback. That's a code that may fail. And if we are open or if it fails, we just say sorry, and that's all. Uh, how much time do I have? Five. Uh, I would. I will do the lot of the thing. Um, also, the more online, so don't worry. Uh, failover um, is kind of cool because generally it's very expensive to implement such kind of things. Is well, you have a node here and the node crash. What that <coughs> can do if you run the failover option in our is that it will take what was deployed on this node and only deploy it there. So obviously, we take some time. So you will have some downtime if you just use it. So you will need to uh, use that with a C2 breaker or something to, to really get um, um, uh, zero downtime. So the first thing I will do is to run what I call bare node. So it's a vertex that runs on the cluster but does not do anything. It's just there. Just wait. Uh, it doesn't have to be bare, it can really actually do stuff, but here, just for the example, I just want to do that. Then I start my uh, HTTP server here. And now I should get, yes. So here, what we have here, the 30108, is this process A. And what we all do when we have a process A? So remember, 30108, I kill it. So if I come back here, you see that's a signal when, when it has been killed. And here on the bear, you see it successfully redeployed, blah, blah. And if I go back here, new PID. I did nothing. I just said set HA true. That's all. And you get the failover for free. Well, if I kill bear, then uh, I don't have anyone uh, on the server, so it's going to be anyway. Very uh, quickly, uh, how to balance the load. I think it's very simple. When you send a message to an address, it will implement a round robin for you. So it will say A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. So that means that if you don't have a lot of load, you can stop C. And we will just do A, B, A, B, A, B. Distributed system fail, I told you. Um, um, so if you have really a lot of loads, just start to do notes. And if you just do the wrong of it for you, you don't have to do anything. So the elasticity 
is great for this. You just start new nut. You are running Kubernetes, you just increase the number of pods. That way it works behind. You will just do the run of it. And if you have this, and you have an HTTP server, what we recommend is to say, okay, you get the request, and you just map this request to an event on the event bus. So you have all the run of it, and you get back, and you write it down. Because everything is asynchronous, you can scale to a limit. Well, there is no limit to this. Because you can scale this, uh, and uh, Vertex will handle the request and do the load balancing. Then you can uh, add new nodes here to do the, the handling. So, well, we have no limits with this. Uh, I will skip this. Um, so, this is just the beginning. I mentioned only Vertex Core, and it was pretty fast on the end. Um, we can do a lot of more things, uh, TCP, right, two streams, or Eric's. All the code I've developed use uh, callbacks and stuff like that. It's, well, it's kind of hard. Everything I've shown here can use Java uh, Eric job, so you can already have your streams. Eric Java is reactive programming, it's not a reactive system. But you can implement your reactive system using reactive programming, and Eric Java is really great in terms of API. Don't use complete equal feature. Uh, uh, the threading model behind uh, doesn't, it's kind of hard. Well, you create new threads. It's that bad. You don't want to create new threads. Um, we have integration with Camel. Uh, we have many, many metrics. We have um, uh, NQP bridge. We have um, well, Storms. OAuth, uh, all the authentication stuff that you can imagine, uh, Mongo, Redis, GDBC, many, many things. Um, yep. To start, and you will have all the list of the components on vertex.io. Uh, if you really want to develop an application in Maven with all the unit testing and so on, because testing a synchronous application is a bit more tricky, uh, we provide libraries for that. So. Go on this uh, blog post series, Introduction to Vertex. It's uh, right now it's a six post. Uh, I should write another six post, uh, but I run out of time. Uh, that will uh, let you, well, will explain you how to start a Maven project, uh, running Vertex, uh, unit test, integration <coughs> test, discuss with GDBC, do REST API, some uh, UI using Twitter Bootstrap, I'm not a, a web developer, uh, using Mongo <coughs> and so on. Um, it doesn't have to be Maven, huh? it can be anything. I did not run Maven, it was just a uh, right click run on, on my ID. Um, a lab that is kind of a book, the Vertex lab. Um, I said it's kind of a book because it's already a more than 60 page explaining all the concepts uh, with, uh, with uh, Vertex and uh, of Vertex and of microservices with Vertex. So discovery is a good worker. And we have more than 400 examples in this rep last repository. Um, if you want to see how it works with uh, Spring Boot, for example, you can embed uh, Vertex in Spring Boot if you don't want to use uh, the, the launcher. If you want to see our HTTP works, uh, our Vertex web works, or you can use server-side template engine and stuff like that, all those examples are here, and they are all written in four language, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, and Ruby. And if you never saw Ruby, that can be interesting. Sometimes it hurts a bit when you have lots of uh, missile. Uh, I will finish here. I'm sorry I was a bit too long at the beginning. Um, I will be around if you have questions. Um, right now if you have questions too. There is a couple of stickers here that are pretty, pretty rare. So take one before there is a, I run out. Um, I put it on the laptop. Um, well, if you like it. Um, <laughs> but it's pretty cool, look. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, if you have questions. Any questions? Yes? Uh, you said that you can plug in a discovery server or something. Yes. Uh, can you use the Eureka or something else? Eureka? Eureka for Netflix. Eureka. So, so Eureka. 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 Oh, Eureka. Oh, uh, theoretically, yes. Has it been made right now? No. Um, um, we support right now DNS, uh, Zookeeper, uh, Consumer, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, and, and, uh, and that's all, and a static file. Uh, 
but it's pluggable. And uh, Eureka is on the uh, roadmap for the next version. Eureka and better DNS management. Um, things like a uh, weave too that came, uh, came there. So yeah, uh, so it will be spread. Um, your service that you discover can be HTTP endpoints, can be message producer on the event bus, can be a database, it can be anything. So that's also important that it's pluggable in terms of discovery infrastructure, but also what you discover. It's even, uh, it uses an I.O. Uh, from Netty, so it doesn't even have this here uh, on the thread book. It just uses some Netty magic thing. There's always one thread at some point. But yeah, so you don't have to worry about that. Netty is managing that thread. My question was if I want to use a different client. Then you will have to use the execute blocking. Uh, or the HTTP server can be asynchronous, and then you can, uh, but be pretty careful that the callback can be a uh, record in the same thread as Chrome. But uh, yeah. Uh, for example, today there is a lot of our users using uh, Fane and uh, Apache uh, HTTP clients too. Yes. Uh, so HTTP blocking is using the worker thread So it's managed by Vertex, but yeah, it's, uh, it's on the thread Another question? Okay, so thank you, and... Uh